Yeah, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Yaron Brook to the show. He is executive chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, author of the best-selling book, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. And I had the uh, distinct pleasure to take uh, an objectivism course at the Ayn Rand Institute in Irvine, California many years ago, and also meet Leonard Peikoff, who uh, I believe was the sole heir to Ayn Rand's estate and been following this work for a long, long time. Yaron, why don't we start? Can I just ask you, who is John Galt? <laughs> I think at the end of the day, anybody who is willing to use their mind and be an independent thinker and, and be and be productive uh, is, is a potential John Galt. So John Galt, at the end of the day, is the thinker in us, the, 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 the rational man. Fantastic. Well, that's a great explanation. You know, why is it, you know, if, if you can just speculate for a moment before we dig into some of the important topics of the day, why is it that um, Rand's work has been so incredibly popular and successful, especially during the Obama administration? There was this giant resurgence of Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead and, and probably all of her books. You know, it's, it's just timeless work. What, what, what's behind it? Why is it so uh, popular and powerful? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's timeless. And what makes it particularly uh, popular and powerful is the extent to which she understood that ideas drive history and therefore could predict when she wrote these books in the 40s and 50s, she could predict that if the ideas in the culture did not change, that we would end up with something like the financial crisis and a president like Barack Obama. That is, she could tell where the culture was heading way before anybody else could because she understood deeply the consequence of the ideas, uh, the ideas that go unchallenged by almost everybody, right or left. Uh, the, the consequence of those ideas in, in the political and cultural realms. So Atlas Shrugged, in many respects, predicts the world in which we have been living, and it predicts the, the primary conflicts in which we live, and presents, the positive is that it presents an alternative philosophy for living to the philosophy that, that the culture gives us. So it usually, usually you get these dystopian novels, and all they are are oblique representations of the evil of authoritarianism, but they really never give you an alternative. They never say, okay, but, but here's how you should live so that this never happens. Atlas Shrugged was written so that Atlas Shrugged would never happen. And in that sense, you have to say that Ayn Rand failed in, in the sense that her ideas, while the books are very popular, the ideas are really not caught hold in the culture. And as a consequence, we continue to hold ideas that are devastating to all of us. And, and I think the financial crisis and Obama administration were just one relatively small example of that. But, but this is an ongoing problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Well, you know, I agree with almost uh, all of Rand's work. And I, I, you know, not not all of it, but most of it. And I, I, I've got to ask you, you know, in your time involved with the Ayn Rand Institute, with, uh, you know, all of this work, you've probably been interested in it, uh, you know, since you came of age, I, I'm assuming. Are there any ideas you disagree with? Not any, not any philosophical ideas, no. I mean, I, I, I'm not a philosopher. It, it, it's kind of above my pay grade to really get, delve into that and really figure out if I disagree with anything. I haven't found anything. Uh, I, I don't disagree with the ethics, and I don't disagree with anything really in the political philosophy. I mean, certainly in particular applications of those ideas to particular events uh, in history. I mean, I would love to know what you would be thinking now about whether it's a Trump administration or whether it's the response to 9-11 or a variety of different things. I, I'm not, I mean, I try to, I, I try to use our ideas and apply them the best that I can, but application is hard. And uh, when I look back at some of her writings about application, sure, there might be things here or there that I disagree with, but fundamentally her philosophy is a positive philosophy for living life and for how to live and be successful in life. And I have not found any uh, flaws or contradictions or things that I disagree with uh, on a principled level in any of her ideas with regard to ethics or political philosophy. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, good. Well, uh, let's go ahead and dive into some maybe issues of the day, if you will. We have this huge contrast, this massive sea change in our, our political tides from Obama to Trump. I, I know what Ayn Rand would think about Obama, 
But what would she think about Trump? <laughs> well, let me first say, I, I don't know what you would think. So, so to some extent, she was a genius. I am not. And it, it's hard to tell. She always came up with really original things to say about current events that I think at the time I could have never thought of. So I'm not going to speak fine Rand. I'm going to speak for myself and I guess for the institution. Um, and, and I would say that... Um, the, what we're seeing in, in, in Obama and in Trump, in my view, are two variations on the same theme. So I, I see more similarity than difference. And I see the one as in a sense of response to the other. And, and by responding, the, it, it's a reflection of the other. Both, in my view, are fundamentally collectivists. Both are fundamentally in opposition to the founding ideas and the founding principles of America. Both have no understanding or really appreciation for the American Constitution and the founding documents. One approaches the collectivism from the left and from a certain hatred of America. And I think Barack Obama was the first anti-American president in, in history. I, I think he really disliked America. And the whole project of Obama was to turn America into kind of a, a satellite of Europe or, or another, you know, just another European country. His motto would be France. Uh, and he, he said, I, I think he had a certain resentment towards the founding fathers and the Constitution because it tied his hands. It restricted his ability to do things. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with you. And I would say to anybody who wants the U.S. to be more like Europe, go and visit Europe. Europe, is, and I was born in Germany, by the way, Europe, Europe is a disaster, okay? Everybody in Europe pretty much has a lesser life, at least from a material perspective. We can argue anything else you want. Uh, happiness scales or whatever. But from a material perspective, people in Europe have crappy little cars. They live in crappy little flats. They have, uh, uh, you know, disastrous governments. Socialism does not work. <laughs> no, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and there's no question. And, and uh, they have many, many problems. And as bad as things are in Europe today, things are going to get much worse in Europe before before there's any uh, semblance of a chance of them getting better. And so we haven't seen the bottom yet. And, and I think we are following in those footsteps. Unfortunately, I think Barack Obama has been very successful. And, and I don't think it's just Obama. I think this has been a project of the left and the right has done nothing to stop it for the last 50 years, turning the U.S. into Europe. And I think they've been, they've been to a large extent quite successful. And I think you can only understand the rise of Trump. It, it, as, a, as, a, as a counterweight to exactly that. Trump is also European in a fundamental sense. He, 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 he's much more similar to the European right than he is to the traditional American right. And in, in the sense that he is a nationalist and a collectivist, both things that are less American, they're, they're less typical of the American political spectrum. Although again, over the last hundred years, the whole country has become less American in the sense that we become more collectivist over time. You see, in my view, America is fundamentally what makes America America it's, it, it is its individualism, is the idea of the sanctity of the individual, the primacy of the individual. We set up a government not to make, make America great. We set up a government to protect individuals. And when you do that, when you leave people free, when government is limited, not, not by... Uh, some notion of Americanism or some notion of American greatness, but it's limited to the protection of individual rights. It's limited to the protection of the individual so that he can prosper. That's when you get the kind of material and I think spiritual success that Americans have had uh, over the centuries. So I think that in that sense, Donald Trump is again, a, a, a not a completely American phenomena. He, he is about a different vision for government. He is about a vision of the government takes on the responsibility to manage, to uh, decide what's good and what's bad for the citizenry, and to really to make America great again. When really what we want from government is to leave us alone. That's what really represents the American vision and, and what differentiates America from Europe and every other place in the world is this, again, this notion of individual rights, this, the, the moral foundation uh, on which this country was founded. Very good point, and, uh, and that, that, yeah, well, 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 well said. So dive a little more into uh, Trump then, if you would, because, you know, Trump is, um, he's a little bit hard to figure out. It's, it's almost like a new, 
it's like a whole new political philosophy. I guess Obama was too, in a sense that he was sort of this socio-fascist. I, I kind of call him, uh, you know, you're welcome to disagree with me on any of this. But but Obama was certainly, a, he leaned toward the left in terms of being a socialist, communist type thinker, but also, you know, in bed with the big corporations, which made him a fascist type thinker. Uh, so it was it was like an interesting mix, actually. What is Trump? I mean, can, can we define him? Well, at the end of the day, I don't think, and, and listeners will be upset with me, I'm sure. I don't think there's that much difference. That is, I think that Donald Trump views himself as a CEO, and he wants to be the CEO of America. He wants to manage our lives, not in the way the socialist would manage them towards some kind of equality. He wants to manage our lives in order to, I don't know, maximize some uh, vision of American wealth and American production. But he believes it's a top-down type of management challenge. And he very much, so he will call Carrier and say, Carrier, you shouldn't move jobs to Mexico. And by the way, if you do, I won't give United Technology the next defense contract. Uh, so he will use the levers of power in order to achieve his particular, since he used fascist before, fascist vision for America, which is different than Obama's fascist vision for America. But at the end of the day, it's the same methodology. It's to use the levers of power, to use government force, to use government coercion, in order to achieve a vision that he has for what American greatness looks like, rather than the founder's perspective, which was leave Americans free and Americans will become great. That is, America will become great. It, it, the purpose is not greatness. The purpose is freedom. Freedom, though, leads to greatness. And this is something neither left nor right understand anymore. Uh, they are all central planners. They are all little fascists, in a sense. They just have a different way. And, and what, what is unique to Trump, I think, is particularly in the way he ran his campaign, is that he has figured out how to manipulate, if you will, the American people. And this is, a, this is an old technique that he has learned again from, from European authoritarians. And that is the technique of scaring them, creating a, creating a crisis uh, through fear, then blaming not us, because ultimately, if you look around America, if there's a shortage of jobs, if there are problems in the economy, we cause them. We, we're the ones who are regulating everything. We're the ones who are taxing everything. We're the ones who are controlling everything. We vote for, these, for the people who do this. But don't blame us. No, it's not our fault. It's foreigners. It's, it's immigrants and foreign governments from uh, China to Japan to Korea to Mexico, even now Germany. It's their fault. And I, and this is the third leg of the kind of the, 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 the authoritarian stool, I can solve the problem. Just give me power and I will put them in their place. And once I put them in their place, everything here will be good. Now he mixes into that also the idea of deregulation and reducing taxes. But those are not the essentials because he couldn't win on those. Republicans have tried and they don't seem to win on those. Those were secondary to the idea of if I build a wall and if I put up trade barriers, that'll really solve our problems. Now, I, I, know, I know you might disagree with this, but I, I believe that is a completely bogus argument. But it's one that worked politically and the one that, that has, has got him to where he is today. Okay, so, I, I mean, but wouldn't it, I, you know, how would you do that differently, all the stuff you said? I mean, don't you, if you're, if you're going to be the president, you have to make deals. So what else are you going to use to make a deal besides those levers of power you described, for example, with Carrier, right, to get them to stay and not take those jobs abroad? But it's none of the, it's none of the government's business whether Carrier takes the jobs abroad or not. What, the, what, what, what you need to do as president of the United States, and this is the individualistic perspective on governing, is to eliminate the shackles on business and on an individual. So the, the priority needs to be it, not deregulate two for one like he's proposed, one regulation, every new regulation you eliminate two. But what we should be doing is zero to 200. That is, we shouldn't be adding any new regulations. We should be massively deregulating the US economy. And we should be focusing on reducing taxes and doing it smartly and shrinking government spending. There's nothing more important, ultimately, than shrinking the very 
dollar denominated size of government because the less the government spends it means the more money is in the hands of individual americans to shape their own lives so if i were president and you know that will never happen but if i were president you know my whole focus would be not on cutting deals with anybody other than congress where you have to cut deals but to shrink government what can i do today every single day you wake up in the morning and say what can i do today to shrink the size influence control of government i want to cut less deals cutting deals as president is exactly what fascism is it's exactly what cronyism is government should have no involvement in the in the in the business life of business if if a business wants to move overseas let it move overseas the key is to create the friendliest best environment for productive individuals in America and you do that again by freeing up the market by deregulating and by shrinking government spending so all of the uh, liberals will say well deregulation isn't that what caused the financial crisis uh, we need to regulate these evil capitalists because they're going to do bad things if if the government doesn't keep them in check and of course they are going to do bad things i think we can all agree on that because none of us are angels that's why we need a government <laughs> but uh, well but, i mean yeah. some some people yeah. a small tiny fraction of a minority will do bad things and that's what we have the police for and that's what we've had laws in the books against fraud forever you don't need the mountains of regulation in order to catch bernie madoff indeed i would argue and i think i could i could prove this that it is the mountains of regulation that prevented us from catchy bernie madoff they were way too busy reading my 13 d's and my 13 g's in order to actually go catch a crook what interest does the government have in why i own 5% of any particular stock uh so it, regulations have nothing to do with catching bad guys and indeed prevent us from catching the real bad guys well let me let me actually add to that and give you some more fuel for that argument i would argue that regulations allow the bad guys to become big bad guys and 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 if you know you listen i say this all the time if if you if you watch the news you'll hear the ceos say well if the government will just get out of the way and stop regulating us and and they say that right that's the mantra but secretly they they love those regulations because those are protectionist regulations that allow them to keep their monopolies it uh, it makes it impossible for new players to enter and and here's an example of it just look around folks you can tell this just through your own common sense you don't need any you don't need to read a book on it, it tell me who is the latest startup that is going to come and disrupt goldman sachs or any big bank or investment bank or any big wall street firm there ain't any because those are such highly regulated industries that the cost of compliance is impossible for a startup now why do we see no startups and no disruption and no innovation in that world we just see the entrenched powers keeping their power yet in the tech world where there's virtually no regulation I mean nobody tells Facebook what color to put the button that you click on right no <laughs> not no, yet no, not, not yet. yet but it's not it's coming but, but look the same thing is true of the automobile industry I mean the internal combustion engine is pretty much the same today as it was 50 years ago airplanes are slower today than they were 30 years ago so the latest 787 from Boeing is slower than the old 737 or those 717 and for for fuel economy reasons yeah, yeah. all kinds yeah. of reasons and the fact is that uh you know the concord which was the last innovation in air flight we grounded so absolutely any industry that you regulate is going to stagnate now partially it'll stagnate because it doesn't allow for competition and partially it stagnates because the human mind human creativity human innovation cannot flourish where there is force where you are forced to think in a particular way where you are forced to fill out these forms and not those forms where you are forced to think within a box the whole freedom leads to innovation because the human mind thrives under freedom thrives where there's no authority to tell it what it must think and how it must think so government regulations destroy destroy innovation destroy creativity destroy productivity not just because of the cronyism but but because of their very essence of of bringing force to the table and and restricting human human ability to 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 innovate to be creative 
Yeah, very, very interesting point. Okay, we got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but any more on Trump's ideology? And then, you know, let's have a little debate about protectionism and, and so forth. Sure. I mean, I, I, again, I think that Trump is, is, a, is, a, is basically countering uh, Obama. So if Obama's fundamental ideology is a f- certain form of socialism, you know, with a fascist tinge, people forget that fascism, socialism, communism are all variations on the same thing. They're all variations of statism. So Obama's variation of statism is, is from the left. Uh, Donald Trump's variation of statism is from the right, but they're all collectivist. And what collectivism means is placing a group above the individual. In Obama's case, the group might be the downtrodden or the minorities or the LGBTQ community or whatever. And anybody, you could sacrifice anybody for that group. In Donald Trump's case, the group might be something that most Americans feel most sympathetic towards because the group is America. Um, but it's still a group. And it's the opposite of the individualism. So we've got a right, a, a right wing, if you will, statism of, of Trump versus a, a left wing statism of Obama. And what I think is tragic is what we're missing is a true American, or we haven't had in a long time, a true American candidate, a candidate who runs on a platform of individualism and that the whole basis for his politics is to free up individuals so they can pursue their happiness, so they can live their life the way they choose to live. And, and everything he does is focus on freeing up the individual, not on, on some collectivistic goal, not on some abstract uh, make America great again, but on how do we make individuals in America have more control over their lives and be less dependent on government. And that would mean reforming welfare and social security and Medicare and in, 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 in all of the uh, regulations that we talked about. But it would be a comprehensive change to the way this country structured I don't believe, I think Donald Trump is going to make a change, but he's going to make a change more in the direction of state control of different things than what Obama would have had us control. Yeah, very interesting. Would it be fair, and I, you know, I I think I already know the answer to your question, because this answer, when I took an objectivism class at the Ayn Rand Institute, the answer surprised me. Ayn Rand would not say she was a libertarian, would she? No, she would not. Yeah, she called them the hippies of the right, I think. She did in the 70s, and if, if you go back and you, you look at the libertarian movement of the 70s, particularly in New York where she was living, she was very much right about the hippies of the right. But, you know, what she objected to was the fact that libertarian was a big tent term that included under the tent a lot of people that she resented. So, for example, the anarchists, they are libertarian, many libertarians, many libertarians today are, are considering themselves anarchists. And she, she considered that a, a dis, disreputable kind of position to have, that anarchy was a very bad thing. And she would not want to be under a tent with anarchists. And, and the same would go for a bunch of other types of libertarianism that all had a variety of different philosophical foundations. She believed to defend liberty, you had to have one philosophical foundation that focused on individualism, on on, uh, the morality of rational long-term self-interest, and a a view of man as a rational animal, as as being guided by reason. And she she strongly believed that if you had, if if you just agreed on liberty, uh, you, you ultimately would underca- undercut the case for liberty if, for example, you approached your argument for liberty, let's say, from a Marxist perspective or from a religious Christian perspective or from any other perspective. You needed to have a proper philosophical grounding, and libertarians was too big of a tent for her to, 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 want, to want to belong to. They, they, she believed she, they undercut their own case for liberty, and you can see the Libertarian Party to a large extent, doing exactly what she predicted they would do. Yeah, very interesting. Tell us about altruism. So altruism is the idea that you should live for the sake of other people, that your moral ethical purpose in life is the well-being of your neighbor or of some other group or anybody really who is in need or is doing less well than you are. So the standard for morality is how much you sacrifice for the sake of the needy. Um, and she considered this morality, which is really the, the moral code that has been prevalent uh, in, in the Western world for, for at least 2,000 years. She considered this moral code as, a, as an evil moral code. 
she would ask the simple question of why? Why is somebody else's life more important than mine? Why is somebody else's happiness more important than mine? And Ayn Rand very much rejected the whole morality of altruism. Now, she, she didn't view altruism, and I don't view altruism, as meaning being nice to people, being friendly, or even as being charitable. She was not against charity. She was not against being polite and being nice to people. She was against the idea that the moral purpose of your life is to serve other people. No, my moral purpose of my life is to live the best life that I can live, is to flourish, it's to be happy, it's the pursuit of happiness. And other people are often necessary for my pursuit of happiness. I trade with them, I enjoy them, I just enjoy human beings and human life generally, so I'm willing to be charitable towards helping people out. But it's because, right, my my life is the standard that I want to help other people. I don't want to sacrifice and, and give up the things that I value for the sake of other people. I want other people to help me make my life better, just as they should want me to help their life better. And we call that trade, win-win transactions. Sacrifice is by definition a win-lose transaction, and she was against that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. That's a very good point. I know we've got to wrap up, and this is just a really interesting discussion, but just back to the concept of Trump and his trade policy, because I think that's really interesting. I remember Leonard Peikoff wrote a book or an article about buy, uh, why buying foreign... Well, it was Harry Ben Swang, and he called it... Uh, Buy American is un-American. That's it. Yeah, it wasn't Ed Peacock. Okay. And, you know, I think that book was written possibly back in the days when Japan was the big deal and uh, to some and, and to some the big threat, which they didn't turn out to be the big threat at all. And I, I really understood and agreed with a lot of that argument. Today, though, I find myself thinking that, you know, the American worker does need a little protection. And listen... I get the idea that it's great to get these foreign products at low prices. I love it. You know, you go shopping, everything's cheaper, blah, blah, blah. And it makes our quality of life better in many ways. But it, it seems like the trade war is really about, you know, this choice. And maybe maybe it's not. So correct me if I'm wrong. But it, it's a choice between do you want high-paying American jobs like we used to have or do you want low price products uh, you know, so to me, that's clearly a false choice, and, and it doesn't. There's nothing in reality that suggests that that is true. So let's start with the idea that somehow uh, China is taking our jobs. It's just not true. It, every economy, economic analysis of the loss of manufacturing jobs in America shows that over 90 percent of the lost jobs are lost because of technology. Uh, we produce today, in terms of actual stuff twice as many goods twi- in terms of units produced uh, twice as many goods as we've as as we did when we had uh, max people working under in, in production which was 1979 so in 19 since 1979 the number of people working in the manufacturing industries has declined while the number of things that we actually produce the number of widgets out the factory door has increased dramatically And the reason for that is simple. The reason for that is technology, robots, computers, and in the future, it's going to be artificial intelligence. And that's just the reality, and nothing you do about China or any of these other countries makes one iota of difference. I'd actually argue the opposite. What trade does is it creates immense numbers of jobs in the United States, and it creates great jobs in the United States. I don't believe Silicon Valley would be as productive and successful and as high paying as it is today, if not for free trade. You, you couldn't produce iPhones and all the, imagine all the jobs that are involved in iPhones in the United States and good, high paying jobs. And, and not only that, the benefits that the United States economy has had from smartphones, because we use them to make ourselves more productive. And, and yet if you didn't have the global international supply chain where tariffs globally are at the lowest rate they have ever been in human history even though they're higher in china than they are here they're still lower than they've ever been on average ever Uh, you couldn't have that global supply chain as efficient and as productive as it is without without these trade deals I, i i i get everything you're saying my only skepticism is this 
you know, when the playing field is so unlevel, when when China, when Chinese businesses don't have to work under OSHA, high minimum wage requirements, the EPA, you know, this is not a level playing field. The U.S. companies are so overregulated. So let's do it, right? So the solution to that is not tariffs. It's not trade barriers. It's getting rid of the stupid regulations. I agree. With I you. agree completely. Get rid of labor <laughs> laws, and California will become the richest place in the world. It, you know, get rid of get rid of the labor laws, the EPA laws, get rid of all this stuff. But tariffs, all tariffs are are tax on consumption. So if you raise tariffs, it's a lose lose proposition. In America, we lose because because uh, all goods, including America made goods, will be more expensive. And of course, the Chinese lose because they lose some of our business. Everybody loses from it. There is no winner from tariffs. You want American jobs, and this goes back to my initial initial thing. Let me let me also say this. At the end of the day, trade is not between countries. America doesn't trade with China. This is, again, the individualistic perspective. I buy stuff that happens to be made in China. I'm trading with some Chinese guy who's making the stuff thousands of miles away. The government has no business in telling me I should have to pay a higher rate to buy it from China because China doesn't regulate their businesses like we in America. I mean, I as an individual go to my government and would say, well, then stop regulating our businesses. Why are you penalizing well, me? Well, I agree with that, but you're not going to change you're not, doing something stupid. I, I agree completely, but you're not going to change that anytime soon. I mean, that's going to well, be a long Well, but tariffs road. are not a solution. Tariffs are lose-lose. We all lose if we have tariffs. And so you, we get stuck with the same stupid regulations. And on top of that, we load on a consumption tax. That is not a solution to anything. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Give out your website. Tell people where they can find out more about you. Well, Ayn Rand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.O-R-G. I've also got a regular podcast, Yaron Brooks. So that's Y-A-R-O-N-B-R-O-O-K. Just put my name in any podcasting software. Uh, and uh, and the book, Equal is Unfair. You can get it on Amazon or pretty much anywhere else books are sold. Fantastic. Dr. Yaron Brooke, thank you so much.